Well, good morning again. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We are so glad that you're with us this morning. So it was September of 2016, and we as a, as a family had just moved here a few months prior. And I was walking back to our house after dropping off our kids at school that morning, and I was turning onto our street, and my phone rang, and I looked at it, and it was my mom. And I picked up the phone. I was like, hey, mom, how's it going? And she's like, Brian, I have such great news for you, such great news. I was like, oh, good news. I'm all about good news. Let's hear it. She said, your dad and I bought a cottage on Spofford Lake. I was like, really? You did? Like, that seems like out of characteristic. I mean, I've never heard you talk about this. How did this all happen? They're like, yeah, there was this little cottage for sale, and we were able to purchase it, and we're going to have a little piece of property on the lake forever. And, and at one level, I was really excited about this because um, I had grown up at this lake. There's a camp a quarter mile down the road from where this cottage was, and uh, so much of my track to ministry came out of my experience there. I would say God used that camp in a significant way to call me into ministry. And so I've always had a very fond place in my heart for that camp and to know that our family was going to have this little cottage just down the road from it so we could always go back there. It was just really meaningful and special to me. And I said, so you guys have like closed on it. It's yours. It's all done. And they're like, well, not quite. They said, we're going to close on it at the beginning of next year. There's some things that are getting worked out. And and what had happened was a guy had bought, there was this group of cottages. Now, to call it a cottage is actually a generous term, right? (laughs) Come to find out, it wasn't so much a cottage with multiple rooms, like it was one room. It was this group of cottages that were like these 16 by 16 structures that was literally one room, and a corner of that room had this little tiny bathroom. It was like some hotel rooms are actually bigger than this cottage. And so there was a group of them together, and this guy had purchased all of them, and he was trying to sell them off individually as kind of like creating a condo association. So they were able to get one of them, and they just needed to close on that deal and then close on all these other deals, and it was theirs. And so 2016 finishes, we cross into 2017, and it's supposed to happen at the beginning of the year, and somewhere along the way in the spring, I was like, hey, did whatever happened with the cottage? Did you guys close on it? They're like, no, not yet. Something went, you know, awry, and it's got pushed back. It should happen later this year. And so all of 2017 goes by. We get into 2018. It's like, hey, whatever happened to that cottage? They're like, yeah, we still haven't closed on it. Two years go by. I'm like, what is the deal? What is going on that you guys can't close on this? And they said, Charlie Donahue. I was like, what in the world does Charlie Donahue have to do with you closing on these cottages? Now, for context's sake, Charlie Donahue is the David Gruber of Southern New Hampshire. <laughs> He's a lawyer, and he has billboards all over the place. You draw, like, you'd say his name, and everybody's like, yep, I know exactly who you're talking about. I'm like, how is he making this closing a headache for you? Well, it turns out Charlie Donahue lived right next to this group of cottages. And because he was a lawyer, he was playing some lawyer games, continually blocking the closing of these deals. And nobody could ever figure out why. Like, was he hoping to buy one of them? Was he hoping to buy all of them? Was he hoping to get something from the sale? And like, every time they said he kept throwing up these motions and kept blocking it. And it was almost like he was just having fun messing with these people, trying to give them a headache. So in 2020, my parents moved out here from New Hampshire and still hadn't closed on their cottage. And I was just like, you know, it's probably a lost cause. We were waiting and waiting and waiting. I was really hopeful to have this place that we could always go back to and visit that part of the country. But when they moved here, I'm like, surely they're just going to let this thing go as well because now they live here and not there. And that's a really long ways to go just to have like a summer home on a lake that you're going to use one weekend out of the year or something like that. So 2022, we're in the fall of this past year, and I walk into my parents' house, and they're like, Brian, you are never going to believe what happened. I'm like, what? And I've completely forgotten about this. They're like, we have finally closed on the cottage in New Hampshire, and it is now ours. Six whole years went by for them to actually close on that deal. And I wonder if anybody here has ever been in a similar situation where you have this thing presented in front of you and you're hopeful for this, whatever it is. I had a kid after first service come up to me with a Rubik's Cube. He's like, I totally know what you're talking about. My parents, my parents ordered this on Amazon 
and it took forever for this thing to arrive, right? <laughs> I'm sure we've all had moments where we hope for something, it's put in front of us, we know it's coming our way, and time goes by. A week turns into a month, turns into two months, and you start wondering, is this thing ever going to happen? There's a guy also in between services who told me about a job. It's like I applied for this job, I had an interview, I thought things were going really well, it was going to be like a dream job for me, and the last words of the interview were, we will get back to you. That was eight months ago, and he hasn't heard anything since. See, sometimes we have these experiences where something is put in front of us, we get excited about it, and then there's this extended period of waiting, and it starts to cause doubt, and we start to wonder, like, is that really going to happen? And as followers of Jesus Christ, like, that's our story. When we read through the New Testament, there's this amazing reality of God leaving heaven through the person of Jesus Christ, coming to earth, inhabiting as human to walk amongst us, to live and to minister, to demonstrate his love, ultimately to die on the cross, to be risen from the dead, to ascend back to the Father. And now, for 2,000 years, we have been waiting his return. And the question is, how is it that we wait? Like, what is it that we do to wait as we wait in order for us to continually have hope nurtured that what God said he will do in the return of Jesus Christ will, in fact, happen. And that's what Paul is talking about today as we cross into Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. This is what Paul writes. Now, concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you have no need to have anything written to you. Specifically, if you're jumping in right at this point, written to you about what is a natural question that surfaces. Well, again, the topic at hand is the return of Jesus. And there are two questions that are surfacing in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5. The first question surfaces in the previous section at the end of chapter 4. And that question is, what about those who in this life have died? Like, what happens to them? And that comes from this expectation that those in the first century had. Those in the first century walked the earth the same time Jesus walked the earth. Many of them gave, them gave their lives to Jesus within a few years or a decade of Jesus having left. And many people lived with this expectation that Jesus is going to return in my lifetime. And so what about those who have died before Jesus comes back? Like what happens to them? Do they miss out? So Paul addresses that question in the previous section, and then here, the second question, naturally, whenever you're talking about Jesus returning, the question always is, in, is well, when? Like, when is he going to come back? Because people in the first century thought it was going to happen in their lifetime. Here we are 2,000 years later, and it makes us wonder, like, okay, is it, like, is, why, what's taking him so long? Like, why hasn't he already come back? Now, interestingly, the Thessalonians aren't actually asking this question, but Paul is bringing it up. They ask question number one. They don't necessarily ask question number two, but Paul is addressing it anyway. Maybe he's thinking, again, it's coming to mind for them. When is this going to happen? But the way that he answers this question is simply reminding them of what they already know. And specifically, what they know about when Jesus returns, when it will happen, is that nobody knows. Nobody knows. The Thessalonians don't know. Paul himself doesn't know. Even Jesus, when he walked the earth, he didn't know. He says in Matthew 24, times and dates are not for us to know. Not even the Son, referring to himself, knows when these things will unfold. It's only God, the Father, who knows. So he's saying, as it um, evolves when, nobody knows. But then he goes on to say in verse 2, he describes and tries to give characteristics and texture to what it will be like when he does return. And he says this in verse 2, he says, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord, it's an important term, will come like a thief in the night. 
So Paul pulls from the Old Testament, specifically Amos 5, in talking about the day of the Lord. That's the day when Jesus will return. And he's pulling from Old Testament prophecy to try and describe what that day will be like. And he says it will come like a thief in the night. Now, whenever the day of the Lord is referenced in the Old Testament, it's oftentimes referenced as kind of like a scary day. A scary scenario. In Amos 5, it says that the day of the Lord is darkness, not light. Amos says, woe to you for those who desire the day of the Lord. And Paul kind of carries that same tone forward in this passage. He says in verse 3, while people are saying there's peace and security. Like people might think their life is good. People might think their life is grand. You're like, it's summer in Wisconsin. We're going to go up north and spend time on the lake. We're going to get out in the parks. We're going to go to the beach. We're going to do all these fun things because it's summer. Life is great. Life is grand. There's peace. There's security. And then suddenly, he says in verse 3, destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now, Paul here is trying to capture, again, the unexpected nature of Jesus' return, specifically meaning nobody knows when. Nobody knows when a thief is going to break in. If a thief is a good thief, they're going to be sneaky and sly and not be like, hey, I'm going to rob your house tomorrow night, right? You don't know when a thief is coming. In the same way, pregnant women know that, yes, they will experience labor pains at some point. They don't know when they will actually hit. Talk to a woman in, in their last month of being pregnant, they're like, oh, I wish it was tomorrow, right? I wish it was tomorrow, but they just don't know when it's going to happen. And as Paul is using these metaphors, if you think about them, they're kind of negative in nature. Now, with the birth of a child, there's the miracle of life, but he's not emphasizing the miracle of life. He's emphasizing the pain that comes before that. And he's emphasizing the destruction that a thief can bring into your life, trying to capture that the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus... It's kind of a scary thing. And as Christians, we say, I've said it a ton from up here, we eagerly await that day. We expect that day. We want that day to come. And it's like, well, if it's like a thief, and if it's like pain, labor pains, why? There's a couple pastors um, from Kentucky a couple years ago on Mother's Day who, who went to feel, try and simulate what it would feel like to give birth. They went to some clinic, some hospital clinic, to uh, have these electric probes hooked up to their abdomen to feel. And as I watched this video, I'm like, I don't think I want that, if that's what Paul is describing. I, I have the clip of the video for you to check it out. Go ahead and take a look. Well, hey, uh, last week our team threw out this idea for Mother's Day that Chris and I needed to go through uh, a simulation of the pains of childbearing. And it sounded like a great idea last week. Standing in the office. Standing right. in the office. But it today, felt, it felt like a good idea. Doesn't seem like a very good idea at all. Let's go do it. Hey, Les, I'm John. Hi, nice to meet you, John. Hey, Les, I'm Chris. Nice to meet you, Chris. So if you could just kind of walk us through what okay. we're getting ready to go through. Ideally, what we're going to go through is just kind of give you guys an experience of what it would be like if you were pregnant and going through contractions. Can we hold hands? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to slowly ramp it up, kind of get you guys yeah. to kind of get a okay, feel. Okay. So what do you guys feel right now? Kind of, kind of a lot of vibration. Yeah, a lot of vibration and my muscles are, it feels like they're being pulled like apart. Yeah. yeah. So what level is that? So this is, intensity on this one is 20 right now. And what's the high? Well, we'll find out. <laughs> when we start hollering, oh, I felt that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a lot more intense. That is a lot more intense. What are the breathing exercises? Oh my gosh! Oh gosh! Just wait. Just wait for that one. Sorry, sweat. I gotta go to a happy place in my mind. Oh! Oh, I'm here for you. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I want to punch you in the face so bad. Hey, it might feel better. Oh, no. Oh, here I go. Here I go. Oh, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Oh, 
Mom, I love you, Allison. I love you I so much. I didn't learn this at Bible College. So <laughs> there are so many women who are feeling so justified right now, right? Like, yes, that is what we go through, right? So you watch that, and they are clearly in pain. Yes, they're laughing because it's kind of ironic and weird, but they are clearly, it gets worse as they go. It goes on for like another minute and a half. They're pushing against the wall behind them. They're kicking. They're rolling around. And Paul is using that experience to describe the coming of the Lord. And as you watch that, you're like, why, why would anybody subject themselves to that? Like, why is it that we eagerly get excited about that? Because what Paul is saying is that the day of the Lord brings judgment. It brings judgment to those who are opposing God. Now, I think part of the reason why he's pulling from Amos and using this term is because the, the message of the prophets always came with two sides. Th there was the message of judgment that the day of the Lord, when Jesus returns, he will bring judgment on the sin in this world. But there's also another side, and this, the other side of that message is there's also deliverance. It's a message of judgment and deliverance. A prophet came not necessarily to predict the future, but for people to change their future, to say, if you keep going on this path, if you keep running away from God, if you keep opposing God, your end will be destruction, but if you turn and go another direction, you will be delivered. It serves as kind of like a, a road warning sign. If you're driving down the road and you see a sign that says bridge out, you know that the bridge in front of you is out, and if you keep going on that road, you will drive off the bridge because there is no bridge, and you will fall to your death. The, the sign stands there as a warning. Prophets were warning people, like, if you keep going in that direction, things won't end well for you. But if you turn around and go the other way, you can experience deliverance. And Paul is writing to the Thessalonians saying that the deliverance of the prophetic message is true for you. Yes, there will come a day when the day of the Lord happens, Jesus will return, and there will be judgment for the earth, but for those who have put their confidence in him, they won't experience the judgment. They will trust that Jesus has experienced that judgment for them, and what they will experience is deliverance. That's why he says in verse 4, but you are not in darkness. Amos 5 says that the day of the Lord is darkness, not light, but here Paul is saying, but you are not in darkness, brothers and sisters, for that day will not be a surprise to you like a thief saying you don't have to worry about the day of the Lord. You don't have to worry about judgment because you will experience deliverance. Verse 5, for you are children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. See, we look forward to that day because while there's this heavy word of judgment, it's another way to say what God is going to bring is justice. He's going to bring justice. Just like we saw in Finn's name this morning, there's fairness. He's bringing justice, impartial justice to this world. Because as we look out into the world, it's very clear to see that our world is not just. It's anything but that. There's brokenness. There's death. There's despair. There's destruction. All at the hands of the people who God created. We are the ones who are responsible and culpable for the breakdown of God's good world. And he's going to bring justice to make everything right. And so we eagerly look forward to that day. And we trust that even though we are responsible for that breakdown, because of the goodness and graciousness of Jesus, we are people who have been set apart from that judgment. And that's why Paul says, so here's how you are called to live. While you wait, here's how you are called to live in the meantime. And the first thing is that you are called to be distinct. Paul will use a series of contrasts in verse 4 through 7 to talk about the distinction and the difference between those who follow Jesus and the rest of the world. And, and this was an idea he introduced at the end of chapter 3, going into chapter 4. He uses the term holy repeatedly. Sometimes we think that, that those who are holy are pious. Maybe they're kind of like stuffy and serious, and holiness means we're serious about our faith. Well, the actual Greek term there means we are simply just set apart. We're different. We're distinct from the world around us. And Paul uses the contrast of light and dark in verse 4 to capture that. He goes on to say in verse 5 or 6 and 7 a couple other contrasts. He says, So then let us not sleep as others do. 
but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. So he uses these other contrasts. There's night and day. There's awake versus sleep. There's drunk versus sober. And he's saying we are called to be different. We are called to be distinct. And we don't use our difference to like hang it over the heads of those who aren't like us. Like, hey, destruction is coming for you. Watch out. We're free and clear. Be careful. No, Paul says at the end of chapter 4, we use our distinctions. We use our difference. He says in chapter 4, verse 12, to win the respect of outsiders, to build bridges, to have influence, to demonstrate to others the love that Jesus has for them. Just last weekend, um, I was walking in our neighborhood, and now that it's nice, we're trying to get out, meet our neighbors, and hang out with people. Uh, There's one couple that we've been talking with back and forth, and I just said to them, like, hey, why don't you guys come over tomorrow night for pizza? We make pizza every Sunday night. There's always more than enough to go around. Would you like to come and do that? And they're like, oh, yeah, that would be great. They were kind of, like, surprised by the invite. So, so they came over, we're sitting in our backyard, and they asked the question, like, how did you and Becky meet, and how did you guys land in the careers that you landed in? And Becky answered her question, you know, saying how she became a therapist, and then the woman looked at me, and what about you, Brian? I was like, well, I was called by God. <laughs> how about you, right? And they, they knew that I was, I knew that I was, they knew that I was a pastor, and we kind of said that in, in jest, but we had this hour-long conversation about their church experience growing up. And sometimes we have this perception that people who have been burned by the church or, or have walked away from the church are just completely anti-church. But the curiosity that they had was mind-blowing. An hour of talking about what does it mean? How is it different? How is it distinct? And I think we could have kept going and going and going. And eventually I was like, you guys should just come check it out. You should come see what it's all about. It probably is different than what you grew up with, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but just come and check it out. And then on Friday night, the, the park by our house had a little, like, concert in the park to kind of kick off the start of summer, and our daughter was hanging out with another friend, our, our, our youngest daughter, and the mom brought her back to, like, bring her back at the end of the day, and she it said, hey, come and hang with us, hang around a while, so the kids were playing, and again, the topic of what I do came up, and there was another woman from our church sitting there, and next thing you know, we're in another conversation, and this woman is inviting her daughter to VBS, and there wasn't this like, yeah, 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 yeah. It was like, oh, yeah, maybe. Meaning, I think there's a curiosity for people. Like, like people are wanting to know what truth is. Like, people are wanting meaning. People are searching for significance. People find that their life isn't working, and they want answers to figure out how to improve the way that they live because they're hopeless. They're discouraged. They don't have what they feel like they thought they would have at this point in their life. And if we build bridges in relationships to them, and if we live distinct lives, it has the potential to open doors for influence. So Paul says we can win the respect of outsiders. So he says, be distinct. But the other thing he says is be ready. He uses that sleep versus awake contrast in verse 6. And while sleeping versus awake says like, well, I'm either out cold and I'm asleep or I'm awake and I'm walking around just doing normal life, there's actually this idea of being on watch that comes with the Greek word for awake. It's not just that I'm awake, which is the opposite of sleep. It's I'm awake and I'm on watch. I'm watching for things. I'm ready for things. I'm anticipating things. And here Paul is talking about being ready and awake and watchful for the return of Jesus. But we're not only anticipating God's activity in some future day. We also should be ready and be on watch for God's activity in the here and now, on a daily basis. So I don't know if anybody here enjoys bird watching. Any birders out there? No, we got some. Yeah, I have a friend who loves birds. Drives me crazy how much he loves birds. I guess birds are part of God's good creation, so we should love birds. I could care less about birds. Sorry for you bird people out there. So it's a friend of mine who we run two mornings a week. And as soon as the spring hits, it's like our runs are no longer about running. It's about listening and watching and waiting for all the birds. So we'll be running, and he'll be like, hey, hey, did you hear that? I'm like, no. 
I, I didn't hear anything. He's like, listen, listen, listen. Did you hear that? I'm like, yeah, Matt, it's a bird. He's like, no, 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 it's a warbler. And he's just giving me all these facts about warblers and their migration patterns and why they're here. I'm like, Matt, I, I don't see anything. I could care less. Let's keep running. Last spring, we were running in Washington Park, kind of running around the lake a little pond there. Like we're running on this path and he just like veers off path because he sees this bird fly overhead. He starts chasing the bird. He's like, we got to go find that bird. I'm like, Matt, I could care less. He is always on watch. He was always ready. He's always anticipating what birds could come by at any moment. And that's how we are called to live in terms of our posture of anticipating the activity of God, not just in the future, but also in the here and now today. And when we live lives that are distinct, and we win the respect of outsiders, and we have the ability to be ready for what God is doing, not only in our lives, but possibly their lives, it gives us the chance to build bridges to ultimately give a reason for the hope that we have. Because Paul goes on to say this in verse 8, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of of salvation. And then he repeats this idea of salvation again. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or sleep, we might live with him. See, the, the call is to be watchful, to be ready, to live lives that are distinct, ultimately to win the respect of outsiders and be able to give reason for the hope that we have. Like, yes, this world is a hot mess, but we have hope in one who is returning and who will make all things right. And that can include me and you. And so Paul says, be distinct, be ready. And the last thing he says is be encouraged. Be encouraged. The very last verse of this passage, verse 11, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Now, what's interesting about this verse is it's like almost the exact same verse that he uses to end chapter 4. If you go back to chapter 4, verse 18, he says, encourage each other with these words. And it seems as though encouragement is a strong theme for the back half of 1 Thessalonians. He will use the term five times through the course of the latter part of the letter. He'll say in verse 7 of chapter 3, we are encouraged. See, the backdrop of this letter is that there's persecution and opposition that the, the Thessalonians are experiencing. And Paul is saying, we are encouraged that you're standing firm in the face of such opposition. And then he'll go on to say at the beginning of chapter 4, I urge you to live this life. The word urge there is also the word encourage. I encourage you to live a life that is distinct and set apart so you can win the respect of outsiders. And then he says at the end of chapter 4, encourage one another. And then he's saying it again, encourage each other. I'm encouraged by what you're doing. I'm encouraging you to keep encouraging others. There's this circle and cycle of encouragement going on. Because the reality is it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to find yourself doubting that what we're doing here is like worth it and meaningful. It's easy to face hard things and be like, I just want to throw in the towel and quit and give up. Like, it's been 2,000 years already. Like, how do we know that this isn't just something that, some far-fetched idea that we caught on the religious train of it and it's never going to happen, right? It's easy to believe those things because life is difficult. Life punches you in the gut and it's like, where in the world? Do I find myself right now? And what Paul is saying is that when things get hard and difficult, what we need is one another in order to keep us on track and keep us going. Because we have a mission. We have purpose. We are called to be distinct and be ready and share the love and light of Jesus Christ. And sometimes that's hard because it feels like the darkness is overtaking the light. But we are called to be the light Sometimes it's like, I just don't feel like I have it today. And what we need is a room full of people like this who say, I've got it for you today. I can give you some of my courage today. You might be depleted, but I'm full and actually overflowing. So here, here's some of mine. See, what Paul is talking about through the latter part of First Thessalonians is that you can't go at it alone that you're not intended to be alone in this. You can't carry on alone 
because life is difficult and challenging and hard. So he's given us one another to help us stay the course while we wait with hope that one day he will return to make all things new. The other thing that he's given us is a simple meal, a meal in the bread and the cup that reminds us of what God has done for us and the promise that he has given us in the death and resurrection of his son. Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, his death is meaningless. If he didn't rise from the dead, our sins are still winning. Death still reigns, but he conquered death. He ascended back to the Father, and we have hope that one day he is returning to make all things new. And this meal is a reminder that death couldn't hold him, and it can't hold us either. And in this meal, you have two elements, two simple elements that remind us of the love that he has for us, to take on the judgment that we deserve because of the sin that we have perpetuated in this world, ultimately so that we could experience deliverance. He has given us the bread symbolizing his body, the cup symbolizing his blood poured out. And as we come together as a community, as we come down the aisles to come before these tables, to take these elements, it's a visual reminder to us that I'm not doing this alone. I'm doing it with all of these people who are coming forward as well. And so in just a moment, our ushers are going to come forward and they're going to dismiss you row by row to come before the Lord's table to take the elements. And all of these four stations are the same. You're going to find in each tray two cups stacked on top of each other, one with a piece of bread in it, one with some juice. We invite you to take both cups so you have the full body and blood of Christ. As you come down the middle aisle, you can go to either one of these stations on either side. And then we just invite you to return to your seat through the side aisle. And the worship team is going to play a song for us. And then in a few moments, once everybody has the elements, I'll come back up, lead us in taking them together. And then we'll finish our service with one final song. But let me pray before we go before the Lord's table. Lord, we pray that this moment would be a moment that is full of meaning and power and hope that it wouldn't be a moment that we just go through the motions because it's what we do as a church from time to time, but that in this meal we would recognize the love of Jesus, that we would recognize the faithfulness of God our Father, who is a good Father to us, that we would be able to see that in this place, Lord, we are full of courage because we're here with other people, and that we would be inspired this morning to say, yes, I, I'm a part of something bigger. It's not just me in isolation, but it's me with this family of believers who are moving forward one day at a time. And so, Lord, we give this meal to you. We examine ourselves to say, Lord, help us see where we have caused breakdown in your good world. May we repent in turn, come back to you, and be able to encourage others to do the same. Pray this in your name. Amen.